All right, welcome everybody. Those of you who are here last week knew we have the Republican Governor's Panel. This week we have the Democratic Governor's Panel. Uh, it's one of the rare spots in America where people try to uh, have open minds, be bipartisan, so welcome. Speaking of which, let me introduce Tom and Bonnie McCluskey. Thank you all for sponsoring this. And making a dramatic entrance, Governor Hickenlooper of the great state of Colorado. Thank you, sir. An undramatic entrance. And uh, Governor Mark Dayton uh, next to him. Uh, Governor Mark Dayton is of the great state of Minnesota. Governor Peter Shumlin, great state of Vermont. Governor Maggie Hassan of New Hampshire. Governor Martin O'Malley of uh, Maryland. And a return visit from Governor Jay Nixon of Missouri. Thank you all very much uh, for being here. And uh, I sort of joke about the Republican governors and the Democratic governors, but it's very important to have governors here because they do something that we don't do in Washington, which is they actually govern, which is why they're called governors. They work with legislatures of the other party. They're able to lead. They're able to find common ground. This is what we're missing in politics in America today. And so it's particularly a pleasure to be on stage, uh, with all due respect to our friends who are in the House and the Senate, uh, with people who actually govern. Thank you all. Great. Let me start with uh, Governor Nixon, since he's on my left here, uh, and Missouri. Tell us, uh, you've been very uh, pushing on uh, early education, K through 12 education, and skills to the workforce. Tell me what you're doing in Missouri on that. Well, first of all, we really believe that the best economic development tool there is is education. I mean, as you sit across the table from folks trying to invest in your state or expand in your state, what they want is strong workers, agile workers, folks that can get up early, stay late, take training, and move forward. And it's up to us as states to get that baseline done, more preschool, more rigorous, much more rigorous high school, and then a path to a continuing life of education. We're very proud in Missouri of some of the things we've done to expand that preschool access, to get new testing in our high schools, and then to also have the lowest tuition rate of any in the country as far as the increases and to, and to focus on, on getting those. We just really believe that that is the best long-term strategy to meet the workforce needs of the future, and it's paying off for us with significant investments and significant moving forward. You know, I was talking to uh, Governor Nixon earlier today uh, about somebody I write about in my next book, who's a deeply inspiring person who nobody's ever heard of. Her name was Jean Jennings. Uh, the reason you haven't heard of her is she was one of the first great computer programmers, but she had to do it in secrecy because it was during wartime. And she was doing the programming for ENIAC in order that it could figure out how to test the implosion of an atom bomb and how that would work. The interesting thing I found about her, sorry for telling this tale, but she's from Alanthus Grove, a tiny town in Missouri. She goes to Northwest Missouri College, uh, and she uh, was supposed to major in journalism, which is what they taught girls back then, but she hated journalism, you know, I can understand, and decided she loved math. She became a great mathematics student at Northwestern State uh, and saw an ad saying, mathematicians wanted and so she answered the ad. She ended up being at Aberdeen Proving Ground when they had to reprogram ENIAC to do it. The reason I say all this is her tuition was $72 a year. I just looked it up at Northwestern Missouri is now $14,000 a year. How are we going to have future Gene Jennings who can come from a family of seven from a f poor farm and make it into the workforce if we can't keep the cost of higher education almost free? I mean, it's, I'll be very quick in my, uh, you can't. I mean, you've got to make sure that, that college is affordable. And the secondary piece of that is if, if the choice is debt or progress, especially for non-traditional students, too often uh, they'll choose to continue with the job they're on or continue underperforming. Uh, the bottom line is why we've, we've worked very hard to get tuition freezes in Missouri. We're expanding our scholarship programs. But, uh, you know, back when I went to University of Missouri Law School not that long ago, First semester tuition, three hundred fifty-seven dollars. Now this is this is the quality of lawyer you get for three hundred fifty-seven bucks. <laughs> but 
You get but, what you pay for. Yeah. <laughs> but my son just graduated. It's far above that now. And there's no way you can work a summer job and do it even. Uh, the bottom line is that it's one of the significant problems I think we have as a country. It's impeding access and passing debt on another generation at the same time. Mm -hmm. Governor O'Malley, tell me about uh, Maryland, what you're doing in education and skills to the workforce. Sure. In a nutshell, uh, we believe, as, as Governor Nixon laid out, that if we're going to create jobs and opportunity and we're going to do these things now, that education is one of the most important things that we can do. Every generation up the skills, broaden the, the skills level of our people. So in Maryland, rather than doing less on education, we did more. We cut our budget a lot, but we made record investments every year in K-12, to and Education Week magazine has named us the number one state for public education now five years in a row. More of our kids now take AP exams in Maryland and pass them than any other state in the union, and we went four years in a row without a penny's increase to college tuition. All three of those achievements were the result of not only uh, positive consensus that we developed in our state, but also intentional leadership at every level, understanding that these are the goals that we are striving to achieve and a willingness to do the tough things we can only do together uh, in order to make the greater investment to give our kids a better shot at a better future. There's still a lot more that we have to do. I mean, I think we have to redesign the way we, we uh, deliver uh, degrees in our country. I believe the shift to uh, competency and uh, uh, the promise of online uh, learning, uh, the sage on the, on the stage giving way to the guide on the side, I think those are important. Redesigning that fourth year of high school so that our kids graduate not only with a high school diploma that means something, but also with some sort of, uh, uh, with a year of college credit already under their belt and a, an industry recognized certificate in a skill that's in demand. So all of these are things that we have to do and bring forward in order to do what every other generation of Americans has done, and that is to give the next generation more opportunities and more jobs. How, how much uh, experimentation is being done in K-12, through say, in Baltimore, where you have um, a chance to do that because it's an urban area? Well, we have a chance to do... Look, we... We have a chance to bring forward new ideas that work in every jurisdiction, mm -hmm. uh, not just in Baltimore. But I will tell you that one of the areas we've seen the greatest jump in achievement levels uh, w w happened when we went about nine years ago to full day kindergarten throughout our state. I was mayor of Baltimore at the time, and I saw our first and second graders for the first time ever score above the national average in reading and math. And that has been a wave that has continued. Related to that, uh, we have been dialing up. Uh, you don't want to put stress on kids as they're entering, entering kindergarten, but we now do test children when they enter kindergarten to see how many of our children enter kindergarten ready to learn. And we've, we've uh, expanded a whole ecosystem of that pre-K uh, learning and development, shifted it from our health department to our education department so that there's standards. And now we've moved in the last seven years from 61% of our kids entering kindergarten ready to learn to now 83% enter kindergarten ready to learn. So do you believe that should be early pre-K uh, pre and early childhood universal across the state and the country? I and my hope for successor in Maryland, our Lieutenant Governor Anthony Brown has made that a very central part of his platform. We passed a bill to move in that direction, but the dollar return for all of us, for the dollar that we invest in pre-K, uh, it's a, I mean, if you put aside altruism, you put aside your hope and desire for a better future, just in terms of the dollars back and the dollar it saves us as a society and in the educational process to invest that dollar in uh, early learning and pre-K, it's a huge return on our investment. Thank you. Governor Hassan, tell us about what's happening in New Hampshire, especially in uh, K through 12 and pre-K through 12. Sure. So what I hear about the most from families and from businesses, I heard about it before I was governor and every day since, is their concern that they won't have an educated workforce. And here we have this great new economy uh, before us, and how are we going to make sure that we have the workforce uh, to, to, to lead and to make that economy work? So... Um, before I became governor, we had had a legislature that had cut our university system budget by half, 
at the same time that they had cut the cigarette tax. So I would say these guys must believe that our young people should smoke more and go to school less. Um, and so we restored that funding. We restored scholarships. Uh, we froze college tuition for the first time in our university system in 25 years in New Hampshire. Uh, we now are, will have a reduction in our community college system tuition this fall by 5%. We're aiming for another 5% coming up for the reasons that my colleagues have talked about. Uh, this has to be, it, it's more affordable now in New Hampshire. I don't yet say it's affordable uh, because it's not for the average student. Um, but we know that we need to also focus on non-traditional learners, mid-career folks who are changing uh, their work. We need to have a community college system and a K through 12 system that helps people learn on a competency-based uh, level. Um, we have some really good models going on in New Hampshire, including a four-year bachelor's degree with our Granite State College and our community colleges for $10,000 for the four-year bachelor's degree, which begins to get a whole lot more affordable. We have a private university, Southern New Hampshire University, which is a leader on the right kind of online education experience. And that's also helping us then drive in our K through 12 space, real focus on competency-based education, including making sure that kids really at the middle school level and their families understand what they're going to need to study and learn between point A and point B. And at the same time, uh, we've initiated a STEM task force to look at our standards. We only require, for instance, two years of math in high school in New Hampshire. I'm not sure that makes sense. And we will have a new pilot um, academy within one of our largest public high schools in Manchester starting this fall. We call it STEAM Ahead, STEM education plus arts, obviously, because the other thing you learn from employers is they need really highly technically skilled people, but they got to be creative, too. And if you don't have arts education, you're not helping with that at all. So our STEAM Ahead program in Manchester West High School will take 75 kids and put, give them STEM education plus the arts. And uh, if it goes as we expect, they will also all have earned a year's worth of college credit by the time they get done in, in uh, 12th grade. So those are some of the things for us, the early education space we still need to do a lot more work on. New Hampshire didn't have universal kindergarten, uh, half day kindergarten until 2006. Uh, we were a local control state, and nobody wanted it mandated. And that's one of the things that we really pushed through when I was in the state Senate. So we've got some work to do there, but one of the creative things that I hope people could take back to their communities is why we don't, while we don't mandate early childhood education at this point, um, our local school districts are beginning to understand the value of working with private daycare providers in training up child care professionals so, because the local school districts understand the benefit to them of having a really robust private early childhood system. But if you could have it, uh, your, if you could do whatever you want, would you have early childhood universal I, for the I, state? I, I think everybody understands the value. In my state, we don't always mandate things that we all believe in, but I think we are moving towards a system where we will see more and more and get towards universal. And real quickly, childcare. you mentioned Southern New Hampshire University, yeah. which is a huge uh, creative force in blending online learning with yeah. place-based learning. I know it's private, but to what extent do you work with it, and to what extent do you think it's a model for the future? Oh, we work very closely with them. Our public educators work closely with them, and what they're really working on, you know, they, they this new, the, the Southern New Hampshire University is called SNU. It also has a residential component, but what they've really uh, worked on is making sure that the online learners have access to real-time coaching. Uh, they've also been using the data that they've gathered to understand which kids who are in enrolled online are most vulnerable in terms of not succeeding, and they really are very interactive with those students, and they're interactive, especially with our public community college system, too. Governor Shumlin, you've, uh, I think, given free two-year college education to everybody in the state. How did you do that, and um, what did you get for it? Well, first of all, I just want to say that it's inspiring to be up here with the governors that we just heard from. Uh, because one thing we get as Democratic governors is that if we invest in education from zero on up we, and workforce retraining, we've got a bright economic future in this country. And if we don't, we won't, and it's that simple. What we have done in light of the challenges that we're facing uh, with cost, and I think the 
first question of Governor Nixon was right on point, was in light of the fact that we governors all are managing tough budgets where we don't have unlimited cash that we can just throw at the universities, tech schools as we'd like to, how can we be innovative? I think Governor Hassan just made reference to what we're doing. In Vermont, uh, we passed universal pre-K this year. I was really proud to sign that bill. Uh, we are now focusing on zero to three because all of the research suggests that the brain development, that that's actually where you really want to spend your dollars, although I don't want to de-emphasize pre, uh, universal pre-K. But we're trying to invest in zero to three. That'll be the next universal push. Uh, but I Wait, think I'm sorry, explain what would you do at zero to three? You basically, uh, if you can get kids at risk, or frankly, many, many kids into um, the kind of support that they need, what we're losing right now, uh, in Vermont is uh, mostly first generation and low income kids and kids who grow up with parents who are addicted, which is an increasing problem, uh, not only in Vermont, from around the country that folks don't want to talk about. We know that if we can get in there early and get them into good, really good daycare, as we call it, or uh, preschool, uh, that the results, all the research suggests, that the results in terms of payback of them having the confidence to succeed going forward is immeasurable in terms of return on investment. So we're working together with both private and public sector to incorporate that. You know, go to anyone been to France and seen their system? I mean, everybody has the option in France to immediately put their kid into really good child care, child support, educational learning environment right from week six. It's an amazing thing. So the point is, that's where the money should hit the road. That's where we should be investing next. Having said that, how do you make college affordable? Vermont has the second, has the first, the highest graduation rate from high school in America. Where we fail miserably is moving kids beyond high school. So what we've said in Vermont is, okay, so let's rethink this. We don't have a lot of extra loot. Let's set up a system in our high schools, which we've now done, much like what Governor Hass was talking about in New Hampshire, where every student has the option either with, through college accredited courses in their high school or actually going to one of our nine participating university, state colleges, community colleges to get a free year of college credit while they're in high school. So every kid now has that option. Two, once you graduate from high school and move to college, only having three years left to pay, if you stay in Vermont and work in a STEM field or other fields where we need you for five years, we'll pay a whole year of your college tuition or a whole semester of your associate's degree. And, you know, I just want to say a word about college. I keep saying to folks, if we all think that everybody needs to go to college, we're dead wrong. We don't. It'd be great if we all could. It'd be even better if we could all get PhDs. But that's not in a real world. Now, I come from this as someone who's dyslexic. I had a terrible, I got my mom here, she can tell you, they never thought I was going to get past high school, let alone college. So the point being, if we can just get more of our students beyond high school, a year of tech training at Vermont Tech, or a year of training that will get them able to run a $2 million piece of manufacturing equipment at my GE plant in Rutland that'll take them from a $9 an hour life sentence with a high school degree, because that's all they're gonna ever see in this workforce, to a $48 or 36 buck an hour job with benefits, we're gonna do okay in America. That's a worthy goal. So what I keep saying is, let's make the system more flexible, Let's do less testing and more innovating. Let's develop an education system that moves every student to their learning challenge and their learning needs. And let's ensure that we don't have a simple cookie cutter where we say, if you're not going to make a four-year degree, you're going to fail. Let's have options to move people beyond high school and we all win. Governor Dayton, I think you spent almost $900 million uh, when you came in for K through 12 and early, E through 12, I guess we could call it. And then you really focused on early childhood throughout the state. Tell us about that. Well, like the other governors here, we recognize the importance of education. And actually, our uh, business partnership, the leading corporations in Minnesota, really spearheaded the early childhood. And they recognize the, the benefits of a well-educated workforce, and especially closing the achievement gap as our uh, communities become more diverse. Uh, one of the differences that possibly is that in Minnesota, we, we were looking at a budget deficit for the first two years I was in office and then for the second two years. So we, we raised taxes on the wealthiest 2% of uh, Minnesotans by 2%, which the Chambers of Commerce told us would mean that our state would be a, a national wilderness area at this point. And in fact, the opposite has happened. Uh, we have 154,000 more people working in the state than we did when I took office. One of the fastest growing state economies. 
more people work than ever before, which is not to say that, that uh, taxes are not important and a factor, but it, it's not the only factor. And just gutting education, as we were doing in Minnesota, and gutting some of the other essential services to keep taxes, especially at the very top, unequal, uh, inequitably uh, low is just not, not the solution, and, and we're proof positive of that. So I'm, I'm pleased with what we've accomplished. I want to go back to your point about the uh, college affordability, too. You know, when I, I was back in the 70s, I worked for then Senator from Minnesota, uh, Fritz Spondale, in Washington, and education was one of my areas. They were reauthorizing the higher ed bill. Back then, college student aid and federal level was one-third grants, one-third loans, one-third college work study. Last time I looked, about eight, ten years ago, it hasn't changed much. It was 2% college work study, 18% grants, and 80% loans, which means for most kids and their parents, it's loans, loans, and loans. So these costs go up because our, our expenditures for higher education are squeezed like everything else by the rising health care costs that we have to absorb. And so, you know, you've got tuition and you've got uh, uh, institutional aid, and when, that, when those aren't forthcoming, you've got to look for scholarships, and the federal government's really backed out of the kind of support that's necessary to, to educate the next generation of Americans. Mm -hmm. Governor Hickenlooper, uh, tell us a little bit about the education uh, reforms you've done here, and especially in the Denver school system. I mean, you were both in Denver and now the governor. Uh, it's been the great leader in both uh, experimentation, charters, new ways of doing things. Tell us what you've learned uh, in terms of education. Well, for, first let me say how much we appreciate all being here. And one of the things I brag on all the time about being the governor of Colorado is we have the Aspen Institute. Yay, so thank you. Thank you for that. And we brag on having you as our governor. Uh, I just came from the opening. Uh, this is a, a quick, short uh, 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 byline, but came from the opening of the art museum here. It's going to blow you away that we just cut the ribbon. It is one of the most beautiful art museums I've ever seen in the world. Now, back to education. By the way, the one in Denver is awesome, too. I Absolutely. Mean, give a shout out for your Denver art, which has a lot of Herbert Beyer, who designed our Absolutely. campus. Yeah. So the Denver Art Museum as well. You ought to check out the Shelburne Museum in uh, Shelburne. <laughs> the next question. Let's go ahead. We, we can do, no, we can do this all day, so <laughs> stop us. <laughs> stop. All right, so... Um, you know, Colorado is, is part of, they talk about the Colorado paradox. We have, according to Forbes, the number one workforce in America, either first or second most highly educated population. And yet, if you look at every part of our, of our spectrum of education, there are problems and challenges. And certainly in Denver, we became an experimenter, and the state of Colorado was hand in glove with that. We have about the most uh, progressive charter school laws. In other words, any kid can go to any public school. And any school district has to allow charter schools to operate within their, uh, with, again, within certain restraints, but within their district. So we so have... Basically a parental choice or family choice model. Exactly. Family choice model where they get to... That now, it doesn't apply to private schools, so it's not, a, it's not a, you know, a voucher system, but it is a very, very fluid charter schools. And we've been adding to that relentlessly. This last legislative session, we put up, uh, we passed legislation that will now have a website so parents can go to, to, to see their school and see how every dollar is spent, how much goes to teachers, how much goes to their pension, how much goes to the building, how much goes to bureaucracy. I guarantee you that will engage parents, always a, a very good thing, but B, it will push schools to be more responsive and to, and to really adapt in delivering the kinds of education that, that, that kids want. What people talk about sometimes some of these, these charters are bad, They're, they don't do a good job. What's interesting is parents are still choosing to put their kids in that, in that school. So they must be doing something right to be attracting these parents. Uh, we looked when I was at, in, in Denver. We did a two and a half year task force on early childhood education. Like all these uh, governors, we recognize it's probably the best dollar you can invest. We passed a sales tax. I think we're still the only city that we did a 0.12% sales tax so that we could get every at risk four year old to get high quality education. We also did the first pay for performance so teachers could get bonuses if they could show they were improving student achievement. Uh, a, a great negotiation with, uh, with our teachers union, but they supported that program. Mainly we increased compensation by about 25%. Uh, well, you have to negotiate to get yeah, these right. things done sometimes. But, and then we, we looked at scholarships, because again, and I, I think what, what, what Governor Dayton was saying, what everyone said, these kids are walking out of school, and, and I think 
a lot of these kids, if they had a better choice when they were 15 or 16, they feel they've got to go to college. They end up taking on all this debt. And then their life becomes incredibly challenging. I think if we had better, we, I mean, we have such a shortage of, of welders and plumbers and electricians right now in this country. I mean, the list, we could hire literally 1,000 people a week in Colorado to do those kinds of jobs. And they're paying. They start at 14, 16, 18 bucks an hour. So that's part of it. But we also wanted to make sure the kids that did want to go to school and, and had that drive, that they would have a scholarship program. So in Denver, we have the Denver Scholarship Program. Any kid, if they're willing to work hard enough, how little money their family may have will not keep them from going to college. And last year, we, we added $100 million to higher ed, the first time we've made that large a increase in the history of the state. But a big chunk of that was to begin that kind of a scholarship program. So hopefully in the next three or four years, a partnership between the private sector, between our foundations and philanthropy and state spending, we'll be able to say that to kids in every part of the state. If you work hard enough, you willing to put yourself through the paces to, to, to get through college, we'll make, make sure you don't leave with a bunch of debt. Okay. Um, thank you. I've um, asked the whole panel one question on education. I think I'm going to go and ask specific questions to each governor that's more related to their specific things they've been doing in their state and then open it up. And so I'll start at the other end and start with you, um, Governor Hickenlooper. Uh, at the security conference we've had here and at everything that's been talking about from Ukraine to what's happening in the Middle East, they say, what could we best do as a country to help, uh, you know, deal with some of these problems? And one of the top things they say is produce more oil, produce more gas, be less dependent, uh, and get Eastern Europe and Ukraine and re the rest of Europe off of um, uh, being dependent on the Russians uh, for natural gas and all. How do you, in a time when everybody's voting in your state on the issue of unconventional sources of gas and fracking, uh, how has the international situation changed your thinking at all, and to what extent can you reassure people that we can have unconventional sources of energy in this state? Well, it's all, you know, the international security uh, sides of this. I mean, we have... Uh, by doing horizontal drill drilling and hydraulic fracturing, we have unleashed inexpensive natural gas that we're going to have for decades. And it's not a field that's going to go dry or have less reserves than you thought. It's going to be here uh, if we're willing to go get it. So our job in Colorado has really been to say, all right, if we're going to do this, how can we guarantee communities that we're going to be safe? So uh, this last February, we announced the first methane rules. So we're going to have our oil and gas companies have to go out to every well every month and measure to make sure that there is no leakage of natural gas or methane from their wells. Uh, we're looking now, in the old days, if they, if they allowed frac fluid or something to leak into a stream or a, uh, a pond, it was, could cost them up to 500 bucks a day if it went on for a period of time. That's, that's the art piece up at the museum. Black magic. It's not fracking. These Vermonters. Vermont and New Hampshire, nothing but granite. There's no fracking up there. So, so the, uh, uh, I think the challenge there is to, is to look at the potential here that we have here, and yet we need to be able to guarantee neighborhoods. And, and even in, so I think we've got water. I, what I started to say there is that they, if it leaks now, it's not 500 bucks a day. It's $10,000 a day, right? So I guarantee you, if you want to get industry's attention, you make it that expensive, and they will fix it. Uh, the last part is we have a, a conflict between people... I mean, if you've been living somewhere for 30 years and they come along and tell you they're going to drill an oil well in that little meadow across the street, you thought maybe there'd be a few houses, but you never thought there'd be a, a, an oil rig there. Most people would say, that's a fair point. But at the same time, if you, if you said, well, that person who owned the mineral rights in that meadow across the street for the last 30 years and maybe spent thirty or $40,000 to buy it 30 years ago, that government could, should come and take that person's private property... Right? Most people say that's not right either. So we have a conflict between two frames of self-interest that are, that are definitely in conflict with each other. And I think what we've got to do is roll up our sleeves and, and take the time to really find the compromises. I mean, there, how can we make sure that we can extract as much oil and gas, uh, especially this inexpensive natural gas? Right? I, I can't tell you, as we convert more coal plants to natural gas, we have reduced our, our per capita consumption of natural gas back down to where it was almost when, when Kennedy became president in 1960. 
or 1961. Carbon, act, yeah, yeah, in terms yeah, of CO2 emissions. I'm emissions, sorry. yeah. Mm -hmm. CO2 emissions. So the natural gas is a is a great tool, transition fuel for climate change. It allows us to use wind energy because the wind will start and stop and start and stop, and you have all kinds of problems with that with coal because it's so filthy when you when you uh, range it up and range it down. Whereas natural gas, you can start up, start down. It's incredibly clean. It, it provides a very very powerful tool. It also, inexpensive natural gas puts about 800 bucks per household back into working homes, uh, in the household budgets of working people, working families. That's a valuable thing. And then international security, right? We don't end up having to send so many of our kids off into, into harm's way, uh, really making sure that we have a secure energy fortune. So I'm a big believer that we can find the, the, the compromises and harvest this energy safely and measure that and, and, and prove that to the public, but that it's going to take a lot of conversation to convince people. Good luck. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Governor Dayton, I have another question for you on economic development, but I know you've reduced carbon emissions in Minnesota by a huge amount, right? How did you do that? Well, our legislature uh, over a decade ago really took the, the lead and set of goals for uh, 2025, 2030, and our, our utilities have really done a superb job. Uh, Excel in Energy has led the way, and we are third among the states in the percent of our Electricity comes from wind energy. We're well, well suited to that, but they've been in the forefront. They've reduced our utilities, reduced their mercury emissions by 95%. So when the EPA uh, latest uh, proposed rules came out, you know, it was really a non event in Minnesota because um, we were already there and, and beyond. And obviously, there's more to do, but, but it shows that it, it can be done. We're not an energy producing state, we don't have all. Uh, we, they do try to take our, our sand for fracking, but we uh, objected that unless they can find oil underneath Minnesota, that um, yeah. doesn't seem quite right. But yeah. you, you got mountains. I mean, you got enough stuff here <laughs> as it is, you know. Let me ask you uh, about the economy, uh, which I was yeah. going to ask about, though, which is uh, you actually had some tax increases at times, but you have, if I think I'm correct, Minneapolis may be the lowest unemployment anywhere in America of any urban area? Uh, Minneapolis, St. Paul, metropolitan area is the, lo it's the lowest unemployment rate now of 4.0% of any major metropolitan area in the country. And Rochester is 3.7% and Mankato is 3.4%. So it's it's really statewide. And, and it underscores again what I said. You know, I mean, I, I give the credit to the people of Minnesota, to the business owners, the entrepreneurs who have taken the initiative. They may not be thrilled about paying more in taxes, but it wasn't enough to change well, wait, the basic uh, equation yeah. that the Minnesota is a profitable place to operate and to expand and to create jobs. It's a great place to raise your kids and your family. So you know, in balance, you know, the, it, it's, it's, we're on the right path. Uh, but we had Governor Walker here, who is, you know, a neighboring state with a totally different approach. How has your economy and his uh, fared? Well, with all respect, I said I finally found somebody who can make me look good by comparison. Uh, <laughs> you know, you compare Minnesota's economic growth of the last few years with Wisconsin's, and we just uh, totally surpassed them in just about every measure. And, and then again, it says to me that it's not just about, you know, gutting and cutting. It's about making wise investments in the future in education, uh, transportation, uh, economic development incentives, and uh, the people are going to benefit from that uh, kind of uh, strategic approach. Governor Shumlin, I have a question for you, but I saw you leaning forward as if you wanted to comment on something that was just said. Uh, no, Walter, nothing personal. I'm, I'm leaning forward because I'm the only guy that didn't get a bar in there. Uh, oh. You, you know, so, you know, I, I think this... I think the staff here said he's a dyslexic one. He can adapt. So I'm doing fine. But if it looks like I'm lunging at you, it's just because I got no bar. Oh, okay. We have a bar in the Meadows reception. Um, let me... Uh, uh, let me ask you about the Affordable Care Act and health care, because you're the only state, I think, that has also tried a single-payer system. What have you learned from that? Well, we're moving to a single-payer yeah. system. So Affordable Care Act is great to expand Medicaid for folks that really desperately need access to health insurance. Uh, the challenge for me with the Affordable Care Act ha has been that those who designed it in Washington, and by the way, most of we governors weren't governor when it was designed. We weren't there to speak about it. We just have to implement it. But the challenge for a governor like me is that Vermont already was insuring, we're not Kentucky, we're not Mississippi. We, we were already insuring our 
Vermonters. 350% of poverty, we had universal through Dr. Dinosaur access to every child in Vermont had health insurance. So when the feds came along and said we got this great bill, turns out it's not as great as what we had in Vermont. So when I go out and build an exchange, I can't go with the federal exchange because I'd have to turn to Vermonters and say, hey, great news, folks. Affordable Care Act's here to help you, and it's going to cost you about a thousand bucks a month, many of you, because their benefits are less generous than ours were already. So there are a few of us who had to build an exchange that is able to not only interface with the IRS, but also interface with the state subsidies, interface with your local, with, with my state department of taxes, and come out with a plan for each person that was supposed to be as easy to shop for as a book on Amazon. Yeah. <laughs> now all I can tell you is only Washington, D.C. could think that that would be possible. <laughs> so there are those of us on this stage who have struggled with websites because of dates and what we were asked to do. And remember, the private sector was never asked to do this. I mean, you could not go to your insurance. You know, I'm a business person. I couldn't go to, the, go to a website, pick a plan for each of my employees or have them do it, have an interface with the IRS for their income check, have an interface with my Department of Taxes for their income check, and come back with a subsidy and pick that they could make sense. Mm -hmm. So everyone says, you know, government's terrible, can't do anything. And private sector always gets it right. Well, if the private sector always got it right, why didn't they do it before they told us we had to do it? So my only point is, the Affordable Care Act gives access. It doesn't, it doesn't, it's not a huge help to uh, states like Vermont that we're already doing it already. So what do we, what's the problem? The problem in health care is, and with the Affordable Care Act, that it does nothing to contain cost. Not much to contain cost. So that's our challenge. Now, basic math. In Vermont right now, we spend 20 cents of every dollar we make on health care. So 20 cents of a buck on average goes to health care. If health care costs grow in Vermont, and this is no different for the other 49 states, at the same rate for the next decade as they did for the last decade, that number doubles. And so I keep saying to folks who really are, you know, governors are actually supposed to solve problems for the future, not just this moment. So I see this one as the biggest potential killer of job growth and prosperity for Vermonters. So instead, what I'm saying is, let's maybe look at what some folks in the other part of the world are doing, like everybody else in the developed world that we're competing with for jobs, and maybe have a simpler system. It won't require exchanges. It won't require subsidies. It won't require websites. It won't require mandates to buy insurance. What we're going to do in Vermont by 2017 is, if you are a resident of the state of Vermont, that's right, just a resident, you will be eligible for the Green Mountain health care card that will give you a great benefits package. We will move the whole state from a fee-for-service reimbursement system where providers now get reimbursed for quantity of care and they got to do more and more quantity to stay in business to one where we reimburse our providers for quality of care. I know it's a radical idea, but preventative care, good diet, eating Vermont food instead of corporate food, getting off the smokes, getting out and running, doing exercise, doing preventative care. So you don't have to do the catastrophic care in the first place. So that's what we're trying to do. Now that means moving to a publicly financed system from a premium system. My legislature all have a plan for them next session to do that. And I believe that we'll be the first state in the country that gets, takes a complicated, too expensive healthcare system and instead moves to a simpler system where our health care providers can practice medicine again, which is actually what they sort of got this into this, most of them, for the first place to do. Second, where you have health care as a right and not a privilege because you're a Vermonter, not how rich you are, not where you work, or not what life choices you've made. And finally, where we contain the ever-rising cost of health care growth, which will bankrupt us as a nation if we don't take some states like Vermont, figure out how to get it right, and hope that others will follow. So that's what we're up to. It's not very ambitious, as you can see, but we're <laughs> going to get it done. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Governor Hassan, uh, yes, uh, you, you've expanded Medicare and Medicaid, I mean, uh, quite a bit, doing it through a very Republican legislature, and you also did mental health. How do you find common ground to work across the aisle to do things like health care? Well, uh, thank you. We did uh, manage uh, first to pass a bipartisan budget. That budget didn't have Medicaid expansion in it. I have a Republican Senate and a Democratic House. Uh, but we did get that done in March, and we did it through a very unique uh, New Hampshire health care protection plan. So we have expanded Medicaid, um, and 
uh, our expanded population will be in our Medicaid program for a year, and then they're going to be moved on to a premium assistance program, which has had the benefit of helping us draw more competitors to our exchange, because one of New Hampshire's challenge after the Affordable Care Act was that we had our state legislature, the last one, said we couldn't build our own exchange because they didn't like the Affordable Care Act. So when I came into office, we established a partnership exchange, but we only had one insurance company on it for the last year. And that doesn't do a lot uh, to begin to uh, bring costs down. So we're now going to have, it looks like, five insurance companies on our exchange next January, in part because of the way we've expanded Medicaid. But the, the bigger question is, how do you work across the aisle? How do you get problem solved. I'm sitting with a bunch of terrific governors who do this all the time. Uh, some of us are in kind of blue states, but most of us are in mixed states. Um, and the way you do it is you take your lead from the people that you were elected to represent. Uh, people in my state solve problems every day, and they do it in their businesses, and they do it in their families, and they do it in their communities, and they honestly don't know what political party you know, their colleague is or uh, another community member who helps teach Sunday school with them is. So you take your lead from the people, and then you make sure that you are as clear as you can be with what you believe in and what your goals are, but you listen to people about other ways to reach the goals. There's a lot of common ground. We all know that this country's great strength comes from the fact that the, our founder's vision had this notion that if you unleash the talent and energy of every single person, that it wouldn't just be good for individuals, it would be good for the economy, and we'd be able to lead. And every generation, we have brought more and more people in from the margins into the heart and soul of community. In my family's case, I have a 26-year-old son with severe physical disabilities. He got to go to school in his hometown because we all followed that vision of our founders to include people. So when you get back to that common vision and when you acknowledge that we all share it as Americans and as Granite Staters, you do argue. And I think one of the things that has been hard for uh, citizens of this country, for uh, people who kind of look at the political system from afar, they'll say to me, God, the partisanship is terrible. I wish you guys would stop fighting. Well, I get that. I, you know, When you raise kids, you have that moment when they're fighting in the kitchen and you think, I don't care whose fault it is, just stop. Yeah. Your dad and I want to cook dinner and talk about the day, just fix it. And I think that's where the American people are with a lot of us. But the thing is, it isn't the arguing that's necessarily bad, because we all argue that's part of how you crystallize ideas, that's how you think things through. It's what you do after you argue. And in New Hampshire, I think part of what happened is we had a very um, aggressive and um, far right backwards legislature from 2010 to 2012, and people didn't like it and they began to realize that that wasn't what they had in mind. And part of it is we know each other, we are friends, we're a small state, and we know that we can respect each other and maybe sometimes even love each other enough as Granite Staters to find a way forward. And that does mean, you know, the hardest part of my job is when my staff walks into my office and says, you know, Governor, you always say it's a good idea to compromise, now it's your turn. That's hard. But it is part of what we have to do. And um, you know, we've, we've been making some progress in New Hampshire on a number of issues this way. And I think we can all continue to do it. Thank you, Governor. <laughs> Governor O'Malley, um, you've had a very good economic uh, success with business and also a very progressive social agenda, whether it's gay marriage, guns, whatever it may be. And I think I've heard you argue or read you argue about that that's good for business, a good progressive social agenda. Explain that to us. Sure. I, I absolutely believe it's good for business. The, uh, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, which is hardly a mouthpiece for the Maryland Democratic Party, <laughs> has named our state the number one state in America for innovation and entrepreneurship now three years in a row. We have the highest number of millionaires per capita of any state in the union, and our people earn the highest median income in the country. And we've also passed marriage equality. We passed the DREAM Act. And when our Republican brothers and sisters petitioned those items to referendum, the people approved them, uh, in some cases by some pretty overwhelming numbers in the case of the DREAM Act. So Richard Florida and others who have written about uh, 
about innovation and uh, the emerging economy and the new jobs and the new innovations, really the solutions to human problems that, that fuel new economic opportunities, they all say that the density uh, and the, um, uh, of, of talented people working to solve problems is something that accelerates the innovation curve. But in addition to the density, it is the diversity of perspectives. I mean, that's why as a country, I believe, that we are such a beacon of hope all around the world. It is the speed with which we are able to bring forward uh, new ways, uh, innovative ways to feed and fuel and, and heal humanity. And the great strength that we bring to these challenges is the strength of our diversity, a pluribus unum, that we're all in this together and that different people from different cultures looking at different problems from different perspectives actually come up with solutions. So I do believe, as I think Maggie, uh, Governor Hassan just indicated, that this is a, a really a, a very fundamentally American belief that every person is needed and that if we tap to the fullest degree we possibly can, not as a crowd but as a community, the individual and unique talents of one another and recognize the, the dignity in every human being, that that is a powerful economic engine of inclusion and opportunity and, yes, also of innovation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Governor Nixon, I want to go back to something Governor Hassan said, because you are probably in the most um, purple state, if I could say it. You have a Democratic senator and a Republican senator. You have a Democratic governor and a Republican legislature. Um, how do you think, both in Missouri and then maybe even in Washington, we can do things to uh, end this sort of partisan poisonous atmosphere we have and work across the aisle to get some common sense things done. Yeah, uh, a couple of things. First of all, we do have, I mean, I have two thirds of the opposite party in both the House and the Senate, so I get the chance to veto and they get a chance to override a little bit. So we tussle uh, a tad every once in a while. Uh, so it's really important that we respect each other because we are going to disagree sometimes. That's good. I, I think that, I don't mean to be overly simplistic, but I try to use the word cooperate instead of compromise. I think if you say compromise to some folks, then you think they're asking them to step aside their values. But if you ask them to cooperate and listen, sometimes you can make progress. Uh, the other thing is I think that interacting with members of the legislature, at least for me, I do it outside the Capitol. I do it back in our districts where, where I can meet with them in a more relaxed setting so you don't get this kind of you know, PAC mentality um, that, that gets going anytime you get in, the, in, a, in a, a legislature. Uh, and, and number three is understanding the great diversity of our state and, and trying to, to put benchmark value pieces that we can all agree on as the centerpiece of discussions. And then uh, not being afraid to disagree. I mean, there's nothing wrong with disagreement. I mean, really all a legislature is in Missouri on the House side is 163 people who are supposed to disagree. There's nothing wrong with that. Uh, as Maggie said, uh, there's nothing, I mean, when it's bad to, to, uh, to, to yell and to scream and all that sort of stuff, but if you can be calm and disagree in, in rational terms, it's stunning what you can get done. I mean, for example, after, real quickly, I mean, after, after the horrific tragedy in Newtown, um, we decided not to focus on guns in Missouri. We decided to focus on mental health. Uh, now, we put, 30 law, we put 30 liaisons out in community mental health centers that are working each day. We've gone, become the number two state in the country in mental health first aid. Uh, we've, we've moved emergency rooms and, and, and police stations working much closer together. And we have avoided, I think, a lot of tragedies and, and are working to make long-term differences in lives. So if instead of saying after that we're going to have a, a debate about how many bullets can be in a magazine, but instead we're going to talk about what we can do long-term to make a difference, it allows you to reframe an issue that is hot in one zone and kind of come one off it and get people to disagree on that, but understanding that since what's happened, they got to do something. So we, we, we try to, to, to uh, I said this before, I mean, being governor, uh, to analogize to a pool game, Mr. Hickenlooper, governor, you never have a straight in shot. Everything's a bank shot, okay? <laughs> it's just everything's off something. Uh, Let me open it up. Uh, yes, Stuart. Shout and I'll repeat. on some phenomenal success that they've had in lowering taxes, creating jobs, uh, increasing their education. Uh, do you have a problem with that philosophy? And also, why do you think there's so many more Republican governors than Democratic governors? <laughs> Who wants to take it? It's a jump ball. 
I'll, I'll take Go for one. it, I'll take, I'll, I mean, we're the fifth lowest tax state in, in the country, and my legislature this year, I vetoed it all, as, did $1.3 billion in tax cuts. I do not think that that's a good economic plan. Okay, we cut taxes four times my first term as governor, focused on job creation. So I believe in low taxes. I believe in a synergistic relationship between, you know, us so that if business grows, we grow too. I think some of these folks are playing around and they're being used um, for experimentation. And if you're going to experiment with something, the tax code is not something to experiment with. It loses confidence in the business sector because guess what? You don't borrow money for a week. You don't make investments for a year. People make investments for five or ten years. Having certainty at state tax codes, instead of playing games with them, and just because people like to play around with tax codes, is a serious mistake at the state levels. And the states that are doing that I would argue very, I mean, it, they, they, can, they, can, they can talk short term, but long term, if you look at, at Kansas or you look at some of these other states that have tried this, I mean, it is a meltdown. I mean, Kansas had to come back the next year. I mean, he may have sat here and said it was a really good tax cut, but guess what? He had to come back the next year and raise taxes by $777 million just to pay their debts. And, oh, by the way, they've been downgraded. We're a triple, triple A state with low taxes. Certainty is really important in government. Uh, especially with different people coming in. And these folks that want to play around with the tax code at the state level is a dangerous thing to do. I want to get Governor O'Malley in, but I do want to uh, take up something you said, and I think Governor Dayton said. We have sort of comparable experiments, which is Wisconsin and Minnesota and Kansas and Missouri. And I think Senator Brownback was trying to make, I mean, Governor Brownback was trying to make that. But what is the comparable that you see between Missouri and its uh, bond ratings, its uh, unemployment, its job creation. Tuition up in Kansas, 30%. Missouri, tuition flat. You know, teacher salaries up in Missouri, tuition flat. Our tax rate lower than theirs overall. The shift to local taxes because the state doesn't meet its burden by the local districts having to raise property taxes, having in to Kansas, go to the voters for locals in Kansas. Yeah, you just shift it. I mean, these needs are out there. I mean, I, I've had long debates with, with guys like Art Laffer and all this sort of stuff and ask them, what's the bottom of the Laffer curve? I mean, you can make a good debate at a cocktail party around the Pachyderm Club that all the money should be in the private sector. Nothing wrong with that. I mean, they'll have somebody will buy you another gin and tonic and give you a $100 check. Okay. But there, and I'm a low-tax guy. I mean, I'm, I'm a very conservative fiscal guy. But at some point, when you dial the, the fire department, you really want them to show up. Okay? <laughs> And when you <laughs> and you got to have a de definition economically. That's their problem. They cannot define the bottom end of services. What are necessary services? So I'm ready to have this debate, but I'd like to have it on an intellectual basis. What should we all agree are the basic services we should have? And then let's go about and pay for them in the most cost-effective way possible. But let's not try to tame government by, by taking money away from school kids, school teachers, and causing low, local rates of taxes to go dramatically up. But and employment growth in Otherwise, Missouri is higher than yeah, employment we're growth jobs in Kansas. Faster than them. I mean, I, it's they got uh, they can grow some sunflowers out there, whatever. But uh, right, I mean, we, they, and that. we like Kansas. We don't I, I like I like every state. I, it just, I think a lot of people make a mistake, like the governor of Texas. I mean, they come out here and they think it's a competition between Texas and Louisiana or Maryland and Delaware. I think you'll find these folks. We're fighting for America. Okay, we're fighting for opportunity for the world. Huh? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> And, and to that point, I think we're also all realizing that you have to do some work as regions and collaboratively. You know, the, the key to our success as a country has been that as we all collaborate, cooperate, as we all care for each other in critical areas, we get stronger. That's what our founders understood. And that's really what, you know, targeted investment, I'm from a very low tax state, no income, no sales tax. So we do do some things differently. But when the people of my state saw a 50% cut to the university system, uh, we were able to pass a bipartisan budget unanimously out of a Republican Senate and almost unanimously out of a Democratic House that we invested in that and mental health and a few other things people do understand uh, by, in terms of values, what you have to invest in and what you have to care for. Governor O'Malley? I was going, I was going to um, say a couple of things as briefly as I can. Uh, one of the reasons why there are a lot more Republican governors now is because governors are up in different cycles. So every four years, 36 governors' races are up. And the last time we had 36 governors' races up was in 2010. And our party, the Democratic Party, committed political communications malpractice around the Affordable Care Act, 
failed to link it, as you've heard some of my colleagues link it, to our economic competitiveness, our economic success, and uh, what we need to do as a people in order to create jobs and greater opportunity and greater prosperity. Uh, that same year was also the year of congressional redistricting, and that's why we also have a very gerrymandered and unrepresentative House of Representatives. But that's for another panel. I think all of this, really, when we look at the choices that we can only make together as a people in order to give our children a future with more opportunity rather than less, is really about balance. It would be nice if there were just one issue, uh, and if you tackled that issue, if you eliminated taxes altogether, somehow that would improve education, accelerate innovation, and the bridges would start rebuilding themselves. But that's not the real world. So we have to strike that balance necessary in order to, yes, be fiscally uh, responsible. We have a AAA bond rating in Maryland as well and held it all the way through the recession, unlike Governor Brownback, who's had his bond rating downgraded, unlike Governor Christie, who I believe has set a record among the 50 state governors in the numbers of times he has had his bond rating downgraded. Uh, be <laughs> so I believe in math. And I also believe that you get what you pay for. And I believe if we want to give our children a future of more, then we have to be willing to do more, just like our parents and grandparents. And the real test, I believe, is that quality of life you achieve. And uh, when you look at taxes, I think the best barometer of, uh, of balance and effort is the percentage of taxes people pay compared to what they earn. And I think that's a better metric if you want to look at that single issue of tax burden. Uh, and Governor Sumlin, did you? No, uh, as, okay, great. Next question. Way over there. <laughs> Governors, thank you so much for being here. Yeah. And I wanted to just make a quick comment and one quick question. The comment is, thank you to the governor from Vermont, Peter Chumlin, for last year, if you remember, I asked you the question about GMO labeling, and you said you would put it into effect law, and it is. Thank you. And I hope all the other governors up there follow suit. And my question, I'm going to fast forward to elections November. And if Hillary Clinton makes an announcement that she is running for 2016, do you all think she should be the nominee? Or <laughs> do you think that even though we know she's going to crush anyone that runs against her, do you think she should go through a primary? Anybody want to take it? Well, I, I, Go ahead. I support, I support uh, yeah. uh, Ambassador Clinton. I don't think anybody else should be inhibited running against her. That's the nature of our process, and she'll have to go out and earn it just like anyone else. Governor Hassan? I, as the, the hostess for the New Hampshire primary, <laughs> um, I will say that, one, I, I would never predict the outcome of any primary contest. Yeah. Uh, we have a primary first primary in New Hampshire for a reason. One, we invented it. We were the first state to say we should have the nominating process outside of Washington. But more importantly, uh, we take it very, very seriously. And candidates come to our state and engage. And they are quizzed, tested, um, and really uh, have to uh, earn the, the the confidence of the people of New Hampshire and then go on to other primary contests throughout the country and caucuses as they should. So um, I look forward to a very vibrant 2016. By the way, I will say, as somebody who's addicted to the New Hampshire primary, I think my wife will attest it, I sort of go up there to Manchester early just to be there. It is really good for a party to have a primary and a lot of competition and a lot of ideas in the arena. Anybody else? Uh, I, I just want to speak to the first part of the question on GMO labeling or the statement to say this. Thank you for your support. I'm proud to be the governor that, f that signed the first GMO labeling law into, into law. It simply says consumers should be able to know what's in their food. I don't think that's a radical idea. And I'm only making this plea in this tent in Aspen because we got more people in this tent than we have in the whole state of Vermont. <laughs> if, in fact you think that what we're doing is important, it shouldn't surprise you that the food manufacturers of America have sued us. They're taking us to federal court. We, it will cost us five to six million bucks, very likely to, to fight that suit. And if you just go to vermontfoodfight.org, 
www.ghostdog.org. You can make a donation to our <laughs> attorney's fees, and we'd love to have your help. Next question. Mr. McNulty. Uh, I'd like to ask another tax question, but I won't <laughs> encourage any uh, experimenting. In fact, without any experimenting with the tax code, it would seem that there's a lot of taxes we've been discussing recently that just aren't being paid. And we've mostly talked about it on the federal level, with corporate tax inversion being the big new thing, which is funny because I thought the word was ev evasion, but, you know. Um, on the state level, is this also an issue? Is, are there essentially, I'm not saying say there are evasions, and I don't want this to be a leading question, but is there essentially missing money, and what could Who it buy? Who wants to take that? Yes, Governor. Every state, yeah. every state tax system, state and local combined, is regressive. So, you know, we got a system built in that we take as the status quo, in which, uh, you know, the wealthiest people in this each state and in this country are paying a smaller percentage of their income in state and local taxes, and in most cases in federal taxes, and yet still think their taxes are too high, and still think it's very, you know, American to want to make more money and pay less taxes or pay no taxes at all or move your overseas. I mean, Byron Dorgan, Senator from North Dakota, talks about a place in the Cayman Islands, one building eight stories high, which has over 10,000 corporations that are housed there. I mean, and nobody thinks anything of it. Everybody, you know, goes to the church and goes to their synagogue and goes to their country club and everywhere else. And, and nobody says, you know, that's really un-American. Because if everybody does that, we're going to undermine the financial strength of this country. And it's not only about people who are evading illegally. It's about people who are just taking advantage of this whole system we have, which says you don't, we're, we don't have any responsibility to anybody but ourselves and our own advancement and our children, grandchildren, inheriting all of it. And it's, it's going to be the death knell of this country, I really believe. Um. One concrete quick answer also. It would help if we could get the Federal Fair Marketplace Fairness Act passed. Right now, there is a huge disparity. Can you explain that? Yeah. Uh, under the sales tax, a lot of, a lot of local businesses, bricks-and-mortar businesses, when they, when they make a sale, then you have to pay sales tax. On Internet purchases, there are significant operators that operate tax-free because of the way the laws are written. That needs to be changed. It's, it's, it's really deteriorating mom and pop businesses. It's taking away Main Street out there. Um, and and uh, the United States Senate passed at 72 votes. We need to get that done so that the states then can then put our, our laws in place so that you're not having people avoid dramatic amounts of local sales tax, which is very important, not only for fire stations and schools, but states. Uh, and that, that measure needs to get done. That, there's a huge uh, level of transactions that are being driven to a tax-free haven there. Governor. Uh, and while we're at it, if we're going to address everything, we really should address the corporate income tax and how, how to figure out what the right transaction is to bring all, that, all those offshore earnings back into the United States and put them to work at, somehow to build our infrastructure. Yep. Uh, I'm looking for Yes, here. Just trying to get a gender balance. Sorry. <laughs> Maryland, and do you think that that's going to erode some of the good work um, in the field of education in the long run, and the workforce for that matter, industry? Yeah, this was one of those issues that managed to pit us against one another for many, many years, kept us from getting a lot of important things done. We, we went uh, to, a, to a, a system where we have, I think, now so five locations, maybe six locations in our state. The lion's share of the proceeds do go to education, uh, though all of us are paying a little more. I mean, we asked everyone to do another penny on the sales tax. We put in place a progressive income tax. We raised our corporate tax. Uh, we, and the lion's share of those new revenues all went for the increased investment that we were making to mostly K-12 to education. Uh, some, I mean, we talked a little bit here about tuition freezes. What tuition freeze means is that together as a people, we invest more in higher ed so that 
the kids that are going through college aren't forced to pay it all themselves like they're like it's a toll road or something so uh, the um, the the compromise that we worked out the cooperation that we worked out on the gaming regimen was something that at least resolved it in our state and put it behind us it is one mix of the revenues we have just as we've had lottery revenues for 50 or, or 60 years. It's certainly not why I got into public service, but sometimes you have to untangle these issues in order to get on to the, the bigger issues that make us better as a people. And finally, yeah, uh, in the blue and white stripe there, sir. I can't see, sorry. What is the policy of each of the governors towards fracking in their state? All right, we've already heard Governor Hickenlooper, and those of you, since uh, Governor Dayton, you don't have unconventional sources of gas, really. Uh, and I'm not sure, do you in New England? Let, let us do Maryland and uh, Missouri. We, we have, uh, along the Mississippi River, we have a very uh, ecologically fragile area, very uh, important tourism, trout fishing, wonderful quality of life. I propose a ban on uh, any fracking in that area. The legislature wouldn't go along with that. But we do have very tight restrictions now and a very vigilant Department of Natural Resources and Pollution Control Agency. But frankly, the jobs that it creates are not worth the economic degradation. Well, well who does have tight gas and wants to talk about it? Governor O'Malley? Yeah, our Western Maryland sits atop of a portion of the Marcellus Shale. Yeah. Uh, to the north of us, Pennsylvania went into this full bore without proper regulations or standards or monitoring in place. Other states are going ahead uh, much more quickly and without as much consideration as we are. We are in the midst of a study right now to achieve that gold standard of the highest resp environmentally responsible standard for, uh, uh, for the extraction of natural gas. I believe that American natural gas could well be a bridge to a much cleaner uh, energy future. Uh, whether it's a bridge or an excuse not to do more is up to all of us. I believe it can be a bridge, and it's our hope that by de developing the highest responsible environmental standard, as I believe John has talked about, as, as Governor Hickenlooper has talked about, that that may be a help outside the meets and bounds of our tiny state to get Pennsylvania to up its game and to better protect our streams. And finally, um, yes, ma'am, in yellow. Make it a wonderfully broad question, since we're going to make this the last question. Hi, thank you very much for being here. One of you wonderful governors talked about art and music and the arts in school. When the economics went down, um, most of our schools dropped art and music, which, according to all studies, is the basis for all our kids being tuned into our other important STEM activities and brain cells. I'd like to hear what all of you are Why don't we about. let each of the governors talk about both arts and education, but creativity and the arts in general for a good economy. And what do you want, uh, Governor Hassan, you want to start? Well, sure, uh, and we do know how important arts, uh, the study of arts generally are not only uh, because, as I say to fourth graders who come, New Hampshire fourth graders come through the state house for field trips, and whenever they come to the governor's office and I'm there, I talk with them. And it's not only fun, it's also just critical to our future because it's helping us develop full people who are creative and great citizens as well as great workers. So uh, we are committed to providing arts education. I think um, the the coalition that is building for arts education, which I hope means that if there is ever another time when there are the kind of cutbacks we saw, uh, something I will fight very hard against, um, that the business community, among others, will be the first in the room to say, no, we need arts education too. It's not an elective. It's not it, It's not an extra. Governor Nixon, I'm going to let you take it, but I want to broaden it slightly because from uh, Hannibal down to Cairo on Mississippi River and Missouri, you see towns coming back because they've embraced arts and a creativity economy. 
Tell us how that ties into economic development. Well, it really does. You're seeing houses rebuilt, uh, art networks, Clarksville, which almost got flooded a couple of weeks ago, is doing very well in that regard. A lot of artisans coming in there, rebirthing, in essence, uh, plus uh, our new dog, Huckleberry Finn. Uh, but anyway, uh, <laughs> but I, it's it's. I think that these smaller towns are seeing that the 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 texture and the fabric. Um, um, is much better understood if you don't just come at it with reading, writing, and arithmetic. Um, and I think it's one of the one of the things that No Child Left Behind. One of the one of the bad things about No Child Left Behind, the way it narrowed curriculum as far as competition and grading. Um, and so we're trying to embrace in towns like Hannibal, in towns like Louisiana, uh, which is really really coming back, Clarksville, and then as you move on on south, some of the great uh, places, uh, the first settlement west of Mississippi, there the French settlements in southern uh, part of. Uh, our state, all of those uh, are bringing festivals back, bringing arts back, bringing music back, and it is meant that they have competed better in schools and in, and in population growth. Of course, you got Branson, too. <laughs> uh, Governor O'Malley, you mentioned Richard Florida as a uh, sort of exemplar of people believing in the creative economy. Yeah, I believe we need more art, and we, and we need more music, and the more we put art and music back into our classrooms, the better our kids do in science and math and reading, and I've seen it. When I was mayor of Baltimore, we went through this bad phase where we thought there was nothing we could do about anything. And one of the casualties in that was a lot of music programs and art programs in our schools. Every time we restored a music program in our schools, the kids started performing better. They behaved better. They came to school more often. Look, this isn't rock and science. This is humanity. And so I'm all for uh, uh, more art, more music. We're developing standards now at our state board of education so that we can assess schools and uh, in order to keep those programs there. Because the other thing is that sometimes as soon as you restore a music or arts program, you turn your back and a principal takes them out. I actually toyed with the idea of introducing a bill to make it a misdemeanor crime for any principal. <laughs> But we thought it would possibly be misinterpreted in the broader zeitgeist here. But more art, more music, and I keep a fully tuned, well, mostly tuned guitar out in the open in the governor's office uh, for all of the, whenever kids come through there, too. This world needs more art and more music. Governor Shumlin. Well, this is a really controversial subject for Democrats. <laughs> you know? I mean, this is tough. The only thing I'll add to everything that they've all said, because, you know, we're, we're Democrats, for God's sake, is that um, <laughs> it boils down to money. And we should talk a little bit about the money, because we haven't yet. And if you think about it big picture, we all know this under this tent. What is our most important obligation in a democratic society, in the most powerful, wealthy democratic society on earth? You know, it's to educate our kids, and that means a full, rounded education all the above, all the things that Governor O'Malley just said. So then why is it that we fund education through the most regressive tax that we could possibly think of, the property tax? So what we've done in Vermont is to say, given that there is no federal education tax, I can't wait for someone who runs for president and says, you elect me president, and I'm going to pass a federal education tax based on ability to pay, and we're going to send back to the states 7,000, 8,000, you tell me what, per, you know, bucks a kid, and then you states take it from there with your aggressive taxes like property taxes. But what we've done with Vermont is made the regressive property tax a progressive education tax by saying two things. First, uh, regardless of how property wealthy the community is that you were born into, we will share property wealth so that any community that chooses at their local town meeting to spend 6,000 bucks a pupil will make the same tax effort as every other community in Vermont that makes that choice. And every community that chooses to spend 12 will make the same tax effort as their neighbors. So you no longer have the kids on Park Avenue in Harlem who are working with different resources. And some get music and, 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 and art and others don't. The second thing we've said is, and then if on your house in two acres, your education tax is higher than a percentage of your income, will reduce your property tax rate. So it's in effect, we've turned it into an equitable, progressive income tax based on property wealth. And I think if more of us did that in America, since the feds can't seem to get their act together, we'd see more art, we'd see more music, we'd see more school programs that are tailored to actual creative learning rather than bickering over how we chop the pencils in half 
in the most obligation, important obligation that we have in a democratic society, which is educating every single kid. Thank you. <laughs> Governor Mark Dayton. Well, the questioner is absolutely right. You know, the cutbacks in funding for education force school boards in Minnesota to make these terrible choices and have to cut back or eliminate uh, arts and music and, and a lot of other activities that are ways of uh, broadening kids' horizons and telling, letting them learn for themselves, you know, what's important to them in their lives. Also, uh, community arts, I think, are very, very important. And we've done, a, I think, a good job in Minnesota over the last 25, 30 years of really pushing arts funding into every community in Minnesota. We now have a legacy fund where uh, citizens voted to raise their own sales tax by three-eighths of one percent uh, a couple of years ago, and, and a certain percentage of that goes to arts funding all over the state for, for communities. So it's really a combination of the schools, but also the broader arts community in the, in the area that's important. Governor Hickenlooper, you get the last word. It's always good to be, it's good to be the host. Um, or the tangential host. Uh, you know, I think the connection between arts at every level and the economy is so, so transparent. I, right after I got elected mayor in 2003, Richard Florida came to Denver, and we ended up having lunch together. And he was describing, I mean, the, the biggest problem, I think, or, well, I shouldn't say that. One of the big problems with our economy is, is we don't, we have plenty of, of patents, plenty of inventions. We don't have enough entrepreneurs. I think all of us kind of compete to see how do you get entrepreneurs to come to your cities and your states. And, and Richard Florida said, you know, most of those entrepreneurs, uh, those nerds, those, those geeks, they were kind of on the social fringe of high school, and they liked to be around the other people that were on the social fringe, uh, writers, uh, musicians. So and we already had a good head start. You know, in Denver, Denver's 2.6 million people, roughly half the population of the whole state. And the civic leaders back in the mid-1980s did a tax outside of government. So it was a tax on the entire seven county area, one tenth of one percent, called the Scientific and Cultural Facilities District. It's the only metropolitan area, I think still, that has such a tax. It's about $46 million a year now. And as a result, Denver's the 19th largest metropolitan area, but it has the, the fourth most visited museum of nature and science with the largest number of paid memberships of any museum on earth. 65,000 paid mem memberships. It's got the seventh most visited art museum. It's got the second largest, at the, the uh, uh, Performing Arts Center has the second largest number of seats and, and venues, second only to the Lincoln Center in the country. And that project come, happens completely outside of government. And I think that has been part of what, you know, Colorado's renaissance is not just Denver. I mean, Denver's become in the last five years, the number one destination for 20, 25 to 34 year olds. They're now, no one believes me when I tell you this, but it, there are more uh, live music venues in Denver now than there are in Austin or Nashville. And that, I had Westwood, the alternative paper that has a sister paper in each of those cities, get the reporters out. So I can now say that's fact, yeah. just so we're clear. <laughs> and we have the highest concentration of painters per capita, partly the light, I'm not sure exactly how they measure that. But, but having that creative environment is really attracting entrepreneurs, right? If you go all over the state of Colorado, according to the Kauffman Foundation, right, five of the top 20 communities in America for startups per capita are in Colorado. And I think that that is intrinsically and directly connected to how much this state has embraced the arts. Thank you all, governors. Thank you very much. Thank you for being here.